Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks uh, for this for attending this lightning talk. And I'm just going to piggyback on what Mahesh was talking about: is um, the need for security to be to be inserted into DevOps. Uh, the latest buzzword being called DevSecOps. And how does Jenkins? What role does Jenkins play in today's DevSecOps? So my lightning talk is basically going to cover a little bit about uh, the challenges that we've seen our customers face when they're trying to implement DevSecOps, and also give you a blueprint from a model customer uh, not too far from here in the Silicon Valley who actually implemented DevSecOps for close to three years and have been really successful compared to the industry averages. But I'd like to also piggyback on what Mahesh was saying. It's all about culture and automation and measurement. And I do agree with that because it takes a lot of time to embed the culture of DevSecOps so that uh, companies are successful. It's not a magic bullet that someone can just insert into your uh, automation and your SDLC and there you have a DevSecOps that works flawlessly. A little bit about me. I'm currently a principal product manager at White Hat Security. Uh, we've been around for close to 16 years now. We started off with DAST, Dynamic Application Security Testing. And then uh, a few years ago, we also started off with static analysis and mobile application security testing. Before that, uh, in my past life, I was an integration architect. So I've been on that side of the world as well, where I hated talking to security people. And um, I, much before that, I was a developer as well. So I've been really on both sides of the world, on one side where I really hated talking about security or talking to security because they slowed us down, and on this side where I'm campaigning and canvassing about being secure and DevSecOps and having application security. Now, consider this. According to Department of Defense, 90%, a whopping 90% of the attacks are at layer seven, which means these are these these attacks are at the application layer and no longer at the network layer. The network security has matured dramatically over the past several decades, so it's more and more difficult for hackers to go and penetrate uh, the network layer. But all of these attacks, if you've heard of Heartbleed, if you've heard of the Equifax attack, if you've heard of Poodle, all of these attacks are at the layer seven. They are at the application security layer, which is why it's important for us to secure our applications. All these logos that you see here on this slide are uh, the most recent breaches that have occurred. And all of these breaches have been at the, at the application security. From, the, from over, uh, over 2,000 customers' applications that we scan day in and day out, at least 80% of those applications have at one, at least one critical uh, secure vulnerability. And that's why it's important for us to implement DevSecOps and secure these applications. So there are two challenges primarily when you're implementing DevSecOps. Challenge number one is that there is lack of security knowledge, primarily among your development teams. And that's one of the biggest challenge. Now, these developers have been trained back in school to be amazing developers, but they were not taught security. Also, even if there were some of these expert developers that have been trained on security, it's very difficult to write thousands of unit tests for security. Now, it's very easy for a developer to write a very, very targeted unit test, but if he has to write similar unit tests for security, it's gonna take him much longer. So the solution to that is find a vendor or a service that allows basically to have more generic security tests to test on these applications. But now that poses a second problem. Now, when these tests are generic, there is an inherent issue that you have to either sacrifice one of these three parameters, speed, coverage, or accuracy. You can have a service that is really, really fast and has great coverage, but that means you're gonna suffer with accuracy. Or you could have a service that is giving you a great depth of coverage and still gives you good accuracy, but that's gonna be at the cost of speed. So what you really need to do is you need to basically use this slider to have various options implemented in your STLC. It's not one size fits all. Every organization is different. 
every organization team's culture is different. You probably are going to uh, factor in a lot of other uh, things in your STLC process, such as where is it that you want to insert security first? What kind of release cadence do you have? How agile is your team? Are you doing releases every week or are you doing them every once in a while, you're waterfall or you're agile? All of these factors are going to help you decide which of these three parameters you're, you're going to optimize on and accordingly choose a solution that helps you implement DevSecOps. So this is one of one of our model customers here in the Bay Area that implemented DevSecOps for, for close to three years. And the way they really started is not really from left to right, which is what commonly perceived DevSecOps is, but they really started right to left. Again, it is about culture and automation, like he rightly said. So they had to first pick the lowest hanging fruit, and then they had to start slowly getting into the left. It was not as easy as you, you basically buy a new tool or buy a new service, and then throw it on your developer's face and say, hey, you are going to use it for today. They had a different type of culture there where they did not want to be enforcers. They wanted to basically be engagement points. So they wanted to be engagers. They wanted to educate their application security. The, the application security had to educate their developers to, to basically um, encourage them to adopt secure practices. So they started off extremely at the right, they started off first securing their parameter, uh, perimeter. They started off with WAF and RASP on their production sites, thereby they are protected, they're, they're able to prevent these application security attacks. And then slowly over time, they started going left. And then they first started doing dynamic testing in production. These are production safe testing, so they started using uh, production safe testing services, such as one of our white hat. And these production safe testing basically at least helped them realize what their risk profile is. What, so this was their risk discovery phase. And then they started slowly going to the, to the left where they started integrating this into their um, QA integration process. So along with dynamic testing, they also started implementing static analysis at this point. Again, this was not an on-demand kind of a automated testing. It was still happening on a more pre-scheduled basis. So it's a nightly scan they started especially. And this is where they first introduced security using Jenkins. They started doing a, a static analysis and a dynamic analysis. And to make sure that they have the best accuracy so that they get completely noise-free uh, results, they basically started verifying these results. They wanted to make sure that anything that they see is completely crystal clear. It does not have false positives because most of these, these uh, the uh, tools and services that are available out there, they are not written specifically for your application. They are written for generic applications. As a result, they have a lot of inherent false positives in them. So they started doing this work so that they can then use the results that were coming out and then automatically they started creating JIRA tickets out of them so that the, the developers basically don't treat the security vulnerabilities, the security defects, any different than the QA defects that they were gonna get. Now, once they were successful in step number three, then they basically went to step number four, which is closer to the left, and they introduced the security automation, the security testing, in their development slash build pipeline itself. So these kind of tests, basically, if you remember from my previous slide, you wanted to optimize for speed. You don't want to wait for someone to go and verify your results, for someone to go and provide you a verification of your false positives. So these were all optimized for speed. And the way they were able to implement that is that for every build automation that ran in the pipeline, they used to compare the delta that that build is producing compared to what is already in the released current release. So you had a current release, and, and let's just say that it had 10 vulnerabilities that you were still aware of, right? You've already done your risk discovery. Now in this phase of release assurance, they wanted to make sure that when you are about to release another version, you don't end up releasing something additional, a delta to what you already have. Which means this is a point where they started failing their builds if there were any extra vulnerabilities that did not meet their policy. Now, 
as simple as this really sounds, the complication here is that you need to have a noise-free golden master of your current release. And then you should also be able to correlate all of the vulnerabilities that your subsequent iterative scans are allowed to give you. So the way they were able to implement that is basically they kept one layer as a golden master and all of these current, uh, all of these release candidates that were coming in had to go through this automation where they were able to compare it and they were, uh, they were allowed to merge with the current branch only if it is free of these vulnerabilities that were previously identified. And the last step that they implemented was basically the maturity three for an, for an application security organization, which is developer enablement. So there are three inherent types of scans. One is basically at uh, closer towards the right, which is your deployment scan. You want to basically make sure that you start failing any of these uh, builds if they have any securities. The next one is at the build, the one I talked about, which is the release assurance. And the third one is within a developer's ID itself. Now here, you have to optimize for speed because developers are, go not, are not going to wait for several hours. So they are going to be basically less accurate or less depth of coverage, but they are optimized for speed. And that's what they implemented at the fifth step, thereby giving developers ability to scan early, more often into their environment without basically causing any disruptions. So developers were able to attack each of these critical issues early in the game itself. And what they achieved after that was phenomenal. So as an industry average, the average time to fix a DAST vulnerability is 174 days. But this model customer was able to basically decrease that time to 92 days. And uh, similarly for SAST, uh, for, for the time to fix a particular vulnerability found using SAST, basically found pretty late and then coming back into your development and then again going through that entire process is 113 days. But in this case, the customer was able to do it in 51 days. Similarly, for the SAS remediation rate, the industry average is 15%. Now, this is basically how fast are you able to remediate a vulnerability within the first 10 days that it was found and then notified. So in this case, this model customer was able to basically remediate this 53% uh, of their vulnerabilities that were notified within the first 10 days. And that is what they were able to achieve using this automation in Jenkins. <coughs> So that's all from now. So if you need any more details, uh, please go to our website, whitehatsec.com. There is a complete case study of all of these metrics that I talked about, including the blueprint that I mentioned to you. Thanks a lot.